to church with us or you come to eat, then this is for you. <laughs> You're family. Amen. We don't shake hands, we hug. We're a very loving and embracing family. Always have been. That's the way my grandparents have taught um, my mom and, and, and her siblings. That's the way that my father's parents were. You come in, you get something to drink and something to eat. And so when you come, you're family. Like all the garden says, when you're here, you're family. <laughs> and today, family, we're going to talk about a very serious subject. Now, normally in my sermons, my father and I, there are, it's kind of humorous, even though we don't try. But today it's going to be a little bit more serious. Because this is a serious subject. And I don't think that we take enough time to really think about this question and apply it to our everyday lives. And as you see in your program, the question is, will you choose the family of Jesus or your family here on earth? You know, we may stand flat foot and sure, yes, though the Lord is my Savior, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Amen. I am blessed and highly favored. But do you really take that seriously? Do you? Do you really understand how you are blessed and highly favored? Do you? Or do you just say it because it's something that Christians are supposed to say when someone asks you how you're doing? I did a little experiment when I was going to the UCR studying psychology. And they said, do these two things and see how people react. Go into a room, can pick out a complete stranger, sit next to them and start a conversation. And see how they react. The next thing is when someone asks you how you're doing, actually tell them how you're doing. <laughs> And I do that. And the reaction of people is quite startling. They're like, I didn't really want to know all that. I was just kind of being nice about it. And you know, that's what you say. And then some people are like, you know, you're kind of going through it. Let me hug you. Let me pray for you. Let me, if you're Catholic, let me go light a candle. A friend of mine, Leslie's mother, when she found out what happened to me, she would go to church every Sunday at Mass, and she would light a candle for me. And to this day, she asked Leslie, how am I doing? And when she found out that I was doing so much better, that woman jumped for joy. Amen. Because guess what? We are all part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. but, the, but another word for the body of Christ is family. You are part of the family of Christ. Amen. Now, Webster's Dictionary, and most people can say that a family consists of a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, la, 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 la. It's a lot to a family. You've got your immediate family, which comes from your mother and your father. You have your extended family, which comes from both of them, of their siblings and their parents. And there you have one big, huge family that you belong to. You develop lifelong relationships with these people. Your cousins are your best friends. Your aunts and your uncles are your second parents. Your grandparents spoil you rotten. And they love on you because guess what? They are the grandparent. They are the wild, they are the hoary head. They are the grandest. They are the ones that you go to when you've got a question about your child. So that's an honor and a privilege to be a grandmother. It's a blessing. Remember, each time any one of us has a child, that is a gift from God. Amen. And you don't sacrifice your gifts from God. You don't. You don't sacrifice your children. Because God's going to hold you accountable for that. Because your actions are going to dictate that child's First, knowing relationship with God the Father. Our relationship with God the Father is similar to our relationship with our own Father when you start out. 
but you grow to know that he is not like our physical father. He loves us more than our physical fathers do. And that's a lot. So, our family is the one that teaches how to cook, how to clean, how to love one another. It teaches us relationships. You know, a boy will treat his wife like he treats his mother. Or how he would like to treat his mother. And that's real. A girl will marry a man who has many similarities to her own father. Why? Because your first relationship with the opposite sex comes from the opposite sex parent. You learn how to be loved by a man through your father, ladies. You learn to love and be loved by a woman through your mother, gentlemen. So in order for these relationships to take flight, as a little kid, you're taught, you're groomed, you're given instruction. I learned how to fry chicken through my Auntie Pumpkin, Minister Wilma Gaines, to all of those of you out in Christian land. I learned how to make pancakes from my father. I learned how to make greens and cornbread through my mother. I learned how to bake from my grandmother. So we're taught all these things. We get these relationships and we become so close to these people. And then we got our friends. And they say friends are family that we choose. Amen. I have a friend that was like a sister to me. Candace, she comes here. She is more than a friend to me. She is my sister. Her little boy is my nephew. She's also my godson, but he's more my nephew than anything. I love her and him with all my heart. Amen. I love her like I love my little brother. And I love him to death. So when the Lord taps you on the shoulder, and says, it's time to follow me. The first relationships that suffer are the ones in your family. They're the first ones to go. And they're the hardest ones to leave. But, see, this is a cool thing about God. He's big on family. The whole universe was constructed around family. He is father. Father means provider. It doesn't matter. It's not male parent. It's provider. He provides for us. Because he has no sex. He's neither male nor female. He is God the Father. So that means that he is provider. He is God provider. He is the top dog. You go to him for everything has to be cleared through God the Father. Then you have Jesus Christ, the Son, the Creator. Yes. Then you've got the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I think of the Holy Spirit to me, this is me, is the essence of God the Father, Jesus Christ. Yes. And it is. Yes, it is. It's their essence, and yes. it is a living, breathing form mm -hmm. that helps take shape and mold this earth. God thought it up, Jesus Christ put the blueprints together, and the Holy Spirit went and got it done. Amen. That is creation in the Godhead. Mm -hmm. And they are one as a wife and a husband are one. Speaking of that, let's go over to one of my favorite books, Genesis. Because that's where, you know, all this stuff kind of got started. So let's go to Genesis 2, 23. Genesis 2, 23. And it says, at last, the man exclaimed, this is the one, is the bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman 
because she was taken from man. This explains why man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Husbands and wives are one in God's eyes, just as the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Jesus Christ are one. Separate duties, like a man and a woman have separate jobs, separate personalities, but they are one in God's eyes. So you see, there's an example. God is big on the family. He said, all right, mom and dad are going to be one as we are one, and they are going to give forth offsprings, just like we did. And when we thought about, let's make man in our image. And that's in Genesis 1, 26. We're going to make man into our image, our image of who we are. We're going to make a, we're going to make a mini me of us. And when the fall of man happened, and God was talking, he wasn't talking to the angels. He wasn't talking to the four living creatures. He wasn't even talking to the elders. He was talking to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. He said, now they know like us. So, when the when the original family structure happened, it was God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the elders, the four living creatures, and the entire chorus of angels. And we've got different choirs. It's a lot of angels in heaven. Even after Satan took a third of them, it's still a lot. So, he said, well, let's make man and woman. So that was the family structure. That was the family dynamic. So you might be asking, so Minister Bristol, how is this going to apply to me in my life? Well, as Christians, we have to think of family differently. We can't think of family as mom and dad and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. No. Because when Jesus came to give the word, he said, I came to separate, to bring a sword, to cause division, to cause friction between families. I didn't come here to play nice. I came here to find the lost. I came here to make sure that I start rebuilding back the relationship that Adam and Eve destroyed in the garden. We got a new family now. We were outcasts. We were told we had to go, just like a parent. And everyone just about in here are parents. And you love your children. And when your children do something that's displeasing, you know, you, you, you kind of, depending on upon what it is, you kind of look over it or you give them some type of punishment. But when your children do the ultimate, I mean, when they lose their whole minds and just go off the deep end, then sometimes you have to separate you from your children. You have to let them go. As my dad said, sometimes you got to let them hit it. And they're going to hit it. Just like we do. We hit it. Sometimes you got to hit it so hard that God has got to bring you from the bottom of looking up at the worms. So if a child, you know when your children are gone crazy and you got to let them hit it, and you got to let them go and you still love them, just like God did for Adam and Eve in the garden. But he's going to bring you're gonna, they're so, you pray for those children to be redeemed, to come back to you. Sometimes you do it through a sibling. Their sibling. Well, who's our sibling? Jesus Christ. He redeemed us. And he told them about it in the book of Isaiah. Let's go to 
Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 59, verse 20. Isaiah 59, verse 20. And it says, The Redeemer will come to Jerusalem to buy back those in Israel who have turned from their sins, says the Lord. He's going to be in the book of Isaiah, which were centuries before Christ's birth. He told them through Isaiah that I'm going to buy you back, each and every one of you. I'm going to pay the ultimate price, and I'm going to come down from heaven, and I'm going to set my deity, put my deity on the line. Because if Jesus would have messed up, he wouldn't have been welcome back in heaven either. So I'm going to put it all on the line to save you, my brothers and sisters my greatest creation. So, just like you, as a parent, sometimes you say, your sister or brother has lost their mind, and I need you to talk to them. I need you to bring them back in the fold. Encourage them. Just like Jesus did for us, so that we can be one big happy family again. How many of you have done that with your kids? It's a true thing. Because you don't want to be separated from your children as God doesn't want to be separated from us. So, he said, alright, plan A failed. Plan B is in motion. And guess what? When you have a plan B, it usually requires a lot more sacrifice than plan A. Plan A was the easy road. But plan B is going to, you're going to have to put a little bit more into it. Something's going to be sacrificed. And Jesus was our plan B. And he was sacrificed for us. But guess what, family? It's the same end result. We're going to be back with the Heavenly Father again. We're going to be his children once more. So, I really wish... Plan A would have worked, but I'm so glad that plan B worked and is working right now. So, in the book of John, Jesus actually tells them, I've come back to buy you. I've come down here to buy you. And you can look at that in John 10, verses 17, 17 through 18. He said, I'm here to pay for you. You're mine. And whoever is mine, I will never let them go. They can't be snatched from my hand. Whoever the Father gives me, they can't be snatched from my hand. And those are the first fruits. Now, not all the world can handle the adoption process back into the original family. Of God. Some of some of us, we can't handle it. It's too much. Like, have you ever known a woman or a man that has an opportunity to have a really good relationship with another man or woman? We'll just take women, for example. You met a woman that loves to be around men that are no good for her. I mean, over and over and over again. She loves to be with no good men. And when a good man comes along, she starts running. Backpacking. Oh, Lord, no, no, because he's too this and he's, well, he's too tall or he's too ugly or he smells too bad or, you know, his car isn't nice enough. Or they start nitpicking every little thing about this good man because they're scared. They don't know what love truly is. They only know their interpretation of love, which is to be used and abused. And I don't know any scripture in the Bible that says that you need to be used and abused. It says the direct opposite. But we have an adversary that says, yes, 
you are to be used and abused, and a good man, he don't want you. Throw that negative negativity out, but some of us can't. It's not our time yet. So she'll run away from that good man and go and get the worst man. Same with men. They'll run away from a good woman and go and get Jezebel herself. <laughs> but God has mercy on them, doesn't he? He allows them to live out their lives the best way they can with that person that he has not. Let me say that one more time. That he has not designed for them. So guess what? That creates an imbalance in relationships, doesn't it? You're supposed to be with Freddie, and you over here with Sam. So now, Freddie is all alone. And God is going to have to make it so that Freddie won't be alone. Because you decided to be with Sam. But he has mercy on you. Because he lets you go ahead and live your life to the fullest with that person. Just like he does with his word. Not everybody can handle this. Not everybody has that little extra oomph in them to handle this. So what, he, so what does he do? He allows them to live out their lives with his mercy and his grace. And he allows the Holy Spirit to restrain Satan so he doesn't mess them up even further. But for us, we like to be, we like the adoption process. We can handle it. We want to be adopted back into the fold. We need it. We crave it. It is in us. It's a thirst that can't be quenched unless we get it. So when we're adopted back into that family and we're whole again, sometimes our real family can't handle it. I'm going to give y'all an example. And I'm pretty sure everyone can relate to it. When you were running out there in the world doing your thing, and you had your cousins with you, maybe your uncles, a couple of aunties, even your parents, you ran out there doing everything that wasn't right, and then God calls you. He hits you over your head with a big old club, just wind her up, and and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I get it now. Yes, yes. And you come back into the fold and they start looking at you crazy like, what you mean you go to church? What you mean you don't get drunk anymore? What you mean you don't do drugs anymore? Well, I can't hang out with you because you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do nothing. You just sit around with your Bible reading and I just can't hang out with you. That's the first reaction. Then the next reaction is, we going to get them back. We're going to get them back. Yep. And you start hanging, and you and they keep hanging around with you, and you keep hanging around with them, and all of a sudden, you start slipping back into those habits. And you start doing things that you used to do. And then God's got to wake you up again, and you'll either heed the call or you won't. But I pray that you heed the call. Because that family member is no longer your family member. Because they want the worst for you. And guess what? We are replaceable. David replaced Saul. Let's go to, um, let's go to Acts. So if 
you are not doing what God needs you to do in that person's life, he will remove you from their life and he will put someone who can. Just like those family members that want you to go out there and do bad stuff still so you can be part of the family. God will remove them and replace them with people that want to love you, that are your real family. Jesus Christ had to go through the same thing with his family. I know y'all remember the scripture. In Matthew, Matthew 6, 24, he says that no one can serve two masters. You can't serve your biological family and God's family too. Unless your biological family is a part of God's family. And it's okay. Because in the end, we all will be family. But for right now, they have to be replaced. Because it will be more harm to you than good if they continue to be in your life. And let them go. Let them go. And if they're to be with you to the end then God will work in their lives and you guys will come back into the fold together. Amen. But if they're not, then don't force it. Stop trying to make a person that's here for a season here for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And don't deny the ones that are here for a lifetime to be only here for a season. Amen. 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 We got to get our priorities straight with our families. We got to understand that the family of God will take care of you because he is your father. Your ultimate father. Amen. So, Jesus had the same thing happen to him. Poor Jesus. Let's go over to Matthew 12 and let's read about it. Matthew 12, verse 32. I'm sorry. Verse 46. Matthew 12, verse 46. And in your Bible, in mind, in mind, it actually has a title, The True Family of Jesus. It says, as Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Now, let me give you guys a little backstory about why this is happening. Jesus is making waves in the area of Judea. And his mother got word that he's over there messing with the priests, making Pharisees and Sadducees, all kinds of upset. He's just doing way too much. And so like any mother, your child out there way we're doing stuff they ain't supposed to be doing, but he was doing stuff he was supposed to be doing. She said, let me go get my baby. Come on, y'all. We got to go get your brother because he is acting a fool. He going to get us thrown out the synagogue. So they go and they find Jesus. And they said, now let me go. Let me go get my baby because he don't gone crazy. So Jesus knew this. Remember, because he's all of God and all of man. So he knew exactly what they were there for. And in verse 47, it says, someone told Jesus... Your mother and brothers are standing outside, and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to the disciples and said, look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So if you got to give up your family like Jesus had to give up his, consider it a badge of honor. Because they'll be back. They'll be back. Maybe not in this lifetime, but they'll be back in the next. Guarantee. That is a guarantee. You can take that to the bank. And if they're back in this lifetime with you, now that there is a blessing. Yes, it is. It happened in this family. 30, I can say, 
I was three at the time. 30 years ago, that rift happened in this family. 30 years ago, these four people were called by God. And the other siblings, nieces, and nephews were not. 30 years later, most of them are sitting in the church. It can happen. It will happen. So it's okay if you're not, if the family that you're born into doesn't follow you in your walk with Jesus. It's okay. Because remember, when you come to church, You've got mothers and brothers and fathers and sisters that are waiting to love on you and make you feel like you are the, the best thing that ever happened to them in their lives. Well, I have a, I have a third set of grandparents, the Guthries. They took us in as if they were our grandparents. Each and every one of us. He baptized me Married Auntie Pumpkin's kids. I mean, this man was literally our grandfather. Him and his wife were not African American. They were white. Do you think that matters in the kingdom of God? No. It can't matter. Because God likes variety, but guess what? We're all sinners, so we all look the same to Him. So we're all sinners trying to stop sinning. So sometimes he's going to have to replace your biological mother with another woman that may not look nothing like you on the outside. But on the inside, she is exactly what you need at the time in which you need it. So let God take care of you. Stop trying to take care of yourself. You can't do it. That's why you're here. Right. You're here because I can't do anymore. I give up. I surrender. Yes. Well, surrender. And continue to surrender. Every time you wake up, surrender. Yes. Every time you think about it, surrender. Don't worry about them people in wherever you grew up in. In Michigan or Long Beach or Harbor City. If they're not walking the same way that you're walking, pray for them. Don't you be mean to them. Don't you be nasty to them. Don't you judge them. You pray for them and you love on them. But you don't have to do what they're doing. Right. If they're smoking weed, all you got to say is, you know what? It has been real and it's been fun. And it's been real fun. But I got to go. Right. Right. And walk away. Use the two feet God gave you. Walk away. Because guess what? There's going to be friends that are not going to do that. That are going to love you for you. Not what you can do for them or what you can do with them, but they're going to love you because you are a child of God. Amen. So, Minister Crystal, how do we do this? How do we just turn it over to him? I understand. You got to give me something to you're saying all this, but I need something to put in my back pocket. I need something to chew and swallow. Well, here you go. This is how you can go ahead and let the family of God come into your life and leave the family of Satan where it is. First off is prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing. Because what is it? It is a one-way street door. Directly to God. Amen. Every time you pray, you are in the presence of the Lord. Yes, All three of them. You are in the throne room of God, in the middle of them, in front of the throne, talking to the big three. Yes, and you've got the 24 angels, the 24 elders behind you. You got the four living creatures on either side of you. And you have got an entire chorus of angels around you. And you are right smack down in the middle of all that. Beautiful. 
then you are talking to your creator. Yes, Lord. That's prayer. Mm -hmm. The next thing you do is you pick up your Bible. Mine is on a tablet. It's on a phone. It's on a tablet. If you like to flip the pages, get a Bible and read it. I don't mean just look at it and read the cover of Holy Bible. I mean, open it up. And let me tell you something. As a ministry, I just got to level with y'all for a minute. I know when the congregation is reading their Bibles, and you want to know how I know? And pastor can attest to it. Because they ask questions. <laughs> when you read the Bible, you're going to ask a whole host of questions. You're going to be like, now wait a minute. Who is now kissing that? Okay, what happened in the Corinthian church? I don't get it. That is going to be your questions going to be on your lips when you're reading the Bible. I don't get it. Our phones will be blowing up off the chain if every last one of us were reading our Bibles the way we should be. Because you're going to have questions, especially babes in Christ. They're going to have questions. Even I have questions. When I'm reading the Bible, Daddy can't shut me up. <laughs> well, Dad, what about this and that and that and this and that? And I'm just, just, just thirsting for answers. <laughs> you guys, now I want to take, I got to go back to school, right? But I might even not go back to school for a master's in divinity. I might go for a BA in Bible correspondence. Because I want to know what's, I want those questions to be answered. Because you're reading the Bible. So that is, you're going to the throne, and the throne is coming right back to you when you're reading the Bible. So that's step one. Prayer and read. You can even read and pray. I pray while I'm reading. So that's your, that's your first thing you got to do. Second. Listen to the spirit. Sometimes if you have to close your eyes and just go in a dark room and just listen to the spirit. Jesus did. Let's go to John 12. This has now become my new favorite passage in the Bible. John 12, verse 49. John 12, verse 49. Say amen when you get there. Amen. This is important. Amen. Jesus is talking to the disciples. And he says, I don't speak on my own authority. This isn't me talking. Please, let's not get that twisted nor confused. As of this point, yes, I am all of God, but I am all of man. And I have to set an example for you of how you should live as a man. The Father who sent me, remember, he always talks about his Father. Who sent me has commanded me to, has commanded me what to say, how to say it, and I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. <clears throat> Down in his voice inflection was a command from God the Father. And you know how he got the command from God the Father? Through that wonderful extra limb called the Holy Spirit. So if you let the Spirit use you and get in you, it will tell you what to say. So that you can leave bitterness out of your voice. So you don't plant the seeds of bitterness into someone else's heart. So you're not mean and manipulative about it. Let the spirit use you. Sometimes the spirit shuts us up. Yes. Let it shut you up. Because yes. sometimes all you need to do is listen. Use these two things right here. God gives us a brain to think and to comprehend. But in order to think and comprehend, we need our senses. And these two right here are some of the most important senses you have. Next to these. 
use these more often. Quiet. They got a whole entire chapter in the New Testament about the tongue and how wicked it is. It can destroy just as fast as it could lift up within like that. You know, I really do love what you're doing. But however, you know, you could do it better. You just lifted that person up and just tore them right down. And that's with our tongue. So we need to be quiet with that. Unless the Spirit says speak. But if you use these and listen, you'll use less of this and there won't be a lot of things that people can say bad about you. Don't you hate when a pretty woman opens up her mouth and it's ugliness coming out of her? Amen. She goes from a 10 to a 2 in about 30 seconds. Just like a man. You see a fine drink of water. This actually happened to us. Watch your family feud. <laughs> Handsome man. Built. Looked like a Greek god. That man opened up his mouth and we thought it was a joke. <laughs> and then spanked his wife and national television like, this is my age. <laughs> you went from an 11 to a negative one. <laughs> so let the spirit allow you to be the sermon. You've got to be the light in the city on top of the hill at night. Let the spirit do that. A fool is considered smart till he opens his mouth. <laughs> so listen to the spirit. Then you got to show love and depend on the Lord. you got to depend on him like for everything. I mean, you got to lean up against him for every Lord. Lord, are we doing this? Can you tell me? Are we doing this? Are we going here? Okay. Okay. Ask me for everything. He wants you to ask. That's right. Amen. Lord, should I wear this today? The little things. Because mm -hmm. you never know. That outfit might be offensive to someone. It might not make you look your best. Ask him. Lord, should I eat that today? Lord, should I do this? Ask him. He wants you to. He's dying for you to love him. So when you show love, you're showing the character of God. Amen. And it's just the little things. Opening a door. Calling up someone and having something nice to say. If you're out and about in the store and you see someone like something and you got a little extra cash, get it for them. Right. It's a love gift. God does it to us. We need to do it to each other. Because God will get you out of the lion's mouth. He will put the crystal on the back of your neck and help you wiggle out of the lion's mouth so that you don't be seen as someone that no one can follow. He'll help you get out of those tough situations if you depend on them. Because we're going to be in tough situations, yes. whether it's by our own demise, or we just have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. But it's a test to know that you're going to lean and depend on me for everything. So if you try and get yourself out of that predicament, you could hurt yourself. You can't pull your neck real quick out of the lion's mouth and snap right down on it no more head. So you got to let God get you out of these situations. And don't worry. Don't worry about your friend. Well, I ain't got no friends anymore because I changed my life for God and I sacrificed everything for him and he ain't really gave me nothing yet. So I don't even know if this is really for me. Get that defeatist <laughs> attitude out of here. That's good. Because you've got to show yourself friendly. Yes. Open your mouth and talk. And let God use you. And he'll send you so many friends, you probably won't even be able to keep up with them all. Because guess what? He wants you to feel loved and secure. And he knows we are of the flesh. He made us communal creatures. So he's going to take care of that. So don't worry about that. 
and stop worrying. He's got you. The birds don't plant, reap, nor sow, but God makes sure they eat every day. The flowers don't get dressed, they don't get their hair permed, they do none of that. But I know I can't look prettier than a bunch of beautiful red roses in all of my glory. So don't worry. God's got you. So let God be your real father. Let Jesus be your real brother. Let the Holy Spirit guide and direct you like your mother would. So that you don't have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from or where your next relationship is going to be headed. Because you'll know already. Because they're going to take care of you. Meet people where they're at. Meet them where they're at. If they're not there yet, don't worry about it. Meet them where they're at. You just be so doing and you be the example. Because you can't let other people derail you from your walk with God. You can't. Because this is the cool part about it. Just because they might not be with us now, they're going to be with us later. Amen. And we're going to have a family reunion that is going to be second to none. So don't worry about your brothers and your sisters. They're coming one way or another. So just sit back and relax and be love with the new brothers and sisters that God has given you. Because guess what? They will be there for you just like he is there for you. Yeah. And God will make sure that you are taken care of because he's a what? He's an on-time God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.